One of the first real looks at how we interact with each other um, was done by a chap called Eric Byrne and came out in the late 60s, early 70s. And it was called Transactional Analysis. And you can still buy the book, it's called Games People Play. And although it might seem quite old with everything that's happened in between, it is still absolutely fundamental in some of the key aspects of how individuals relate to each other, particularly when you look at it in terms of organisations or hierarchical groupings. As I say, this was called transactional analysis. And according to Eric Byrne, when we interact with other people, we do so from one of three basic places. Or if you like, we use one of three essential strategies for interacting with each other. There is the parent, there is the adult, and there is the child. Yeah. Now of those three, everybody in the world has direct experience of one of those. Which one? Well, of course, it's child. We've all been there. And when we're born, we're born into a world and we see these godlike creatures, our parents, walking around. To us, they're godlike. We don't know at that time that inside they're all going, I'm not ready for this, I don't know how to do this. But as far as we're concerned, they know everything and the way they behave is the way. Their world becomes our world. And we learn everything about interacting with other people from them. We do whatever is necessary for them to give us good loving energy and to feed us and to hopefully avoid angry negative energy and pain. And that works out very well and we understand how to behave with them and we model those behaviours. After a while, along comes little brother or little sister, or we go to school or kindergarten or whatever, and we see these other little people running around. And that gives us a bit of a problem because we then say, well, how do I relate to these little people? And if you've had children or watched little ones, you can see that sort of incomprehension in their eyes when they're confronted with another child. And the child thinks, well, they're obviously not one of these, so I don't relate in that way, but how do I? The only other way I know how to relate is the way they relate to me. So I adopt the behaviours that my parents have given me, and I relate to the other children largely through those behaviours. And again, if you've had a couple of children or you've seen older and younger children, you can see the older child very often adopting a very, look little Johnny, look little Jane, this is how you do it, or being very, inverted commas, parental towards them. So they've got the behaving to other people as the child or as the parent. Now there are some key activities here. What, what is the essential characteristic of the child's relationship with the parent, particularly when they're very young? There's one of dependency, of course. So when we're behaving in there, is there is this whole sense of being dependent on the other person. And here, as parent, the idea there is that I should, or am, but I should be, in control. I should be the one that's leading here. Now, for many people, they go through life and this parent and child are the only two strategies they have for interacting with other people. Both of these, if you read the book, are cut down into many, many different subtypes. But there are two essential subtypes we're going to deal with. Byrne calls them something different, but we're going to use two terms which are very descriptive, if not technically accurate for all you psychologists watching. On the parent, there are two aspects of parent. There's natural parent, and you know natural parent when your concern is totally on the welfare and the well-being of the other person. It doesn't matter what you think or your opinion, it's really for them that the love and the attention is directed. The other parent is, of course, when we get tense, when that other child doesn't do what we want them to do and we get impatient and we get probably a little angry and a little tense and we start telling them what to do. Not like that, like this. 
Do it like this. Oh, for goodness sake, will you just X, Y, Z? And that one, instead of calling it natural parent, we'll call it controlling parent. Okay? And that's the one we're going to be concentrating on. Now, in child, there's natural child. And even as adults, we experience natural child when we're having a great time with our mates, playing with our kids, um, just essentially in flow, present in flow, full of joy and doing what we want to do. The other bit of child goes back to that dependency. And we all know this. When we're driving along in the car and we see that little blue light in our window, what's our first reaction? That little, oh shit, have I done something wrong? We look at the speed, oh no, it's not me. Or when somebody calls us down, even with adults, if somebody calls somebody by their full name, Jefferson, there's still a little part of me that goes, oh, what have I done now? Even though it might not be relevant. Figures of authority, uh, people that we really care about what they think about us. We can all be go into this child. Our child is triggered because a part of us is emotionally or psychologically or even materially dependent upon them. Those times that you thought your boss was absurd or completely wrong, but you bit your lip and you went, yeah, okay, no, that's fine. And you walked off and did it because there was this feeling of dependency within you. I better not upset this person because if, they, if I do, bad things can happen. Okay. And that's what we're going to be looking at later. And then, and then there's this adult thing. Now, we're supposed to just sort of like a butterfly emerge from this into this fully fledged adult self. Now, this is quite interesting in our society for a couple of main reasons. One is that we don't have a ritual whereby young adults are told and the whole community is aware that they are moving from dependent childhood to independent contributing adulthood. Many traditional societies have this, we don't. We have a, a period of time for young people called adolescence or teenage. And generally, there's a pretty negative cast on that. Often I'll be working with people and I'll say, oh, how old are your children? And I'll say, oh, they're great, they're eight and 11. And I'll say, fantastic. And they'll say, yeah, it's great. Yeah, but they'll be teenagers soon and that's going to be terrible. And it's like, no, 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 no. That age is when they are actually finding out their own separate, unique self. They might be saying, thanks, Mom, thanks, Dad, for all that stuff you've given me. I need to find out what's mine and, and what's yours. And of course it's difficult, and of course they challenge, and of course they question. But if we can support that as a positive process of that self-definition definition and that self-realizing process, fine. When we start to judge it as something that is uh, inevitably going to be difficult, then that's where relationships break down. The other problem with adult in our society is we very rarely see models, role models for real adult to adult behavior. If you look at any film posters, 80% of those will be about something violent or something dominating. You know, usually the hero with the gun or the arrow or whatever. Or if you watch TV, if you watch um, a soap opera in the UK, let's take EastEnders. You don't have to watch it with the sound, you just turn the sound down and see how many open, balanced, adult-to-adult -adult relationships are being modelled there. Very few. They're usually parent-child, and they're quite dramatic and predominantly negative. But happily, as human beings, we do have this potential to understand what the adult is. And we all of us, I hope, are well aware of what an adult-to-adult -adult relationship is like. And that's very important. Now, when we work with these, we will ask people, as I ask you, to think of someone that you know or a circumstance that suddenly oh, makes you feel like that little child again. For some people, it's still their parents can make them feel like that or going back to the old family home. For others, it's a tone of voice or it's somebody in authority. 
or it might be a, a boss that's a bit of a bully or somebody two or three levels above you in the hierarchy. Or it might just be something that triggers that, that child from the past. A very silly example uh, from my life would be when I was a lot younger and working hard. At the weekends I would go to the supermarket and to show my family what a great father I was being providing for the family. And I'd sally out to the supermarket. And as I was going, my wife would call down, Ah, oh, Jeff, by the way, while you're going, can you pick up this, that and the other? And i go, yes, of course I can. And she'd say, look, do you want me to write it down? Don't be ridiculous, I can remember that. And sally forth I would. An hour or so later, I'd come back, lay all the goods out on the table. And as she was coming down the stairs, she'd say, oh, fantastic. Oh, by the way, did you remember? And i go, ooh, because I'd forgotten. Of course I'd forgotten. Well, that only happens for the first 10 years or so. And now if I'm asked, I say, please write it down. You know, we do learn after a while. But the key thing there is just that little moment when I go, oh, I forgot I have done something wrong within whatever framework. So think of something or somebody that makes you feel like that. And just take a moment or two to write down how you feel. What emotions are you feeling at that time? and see what it is. Just write them now, a single word or two. Now you can see on screen some of the answers, some of the very common, consistent answers we get when we ask people in our working groups what emotions they feel when they are in that dependent child state. Okay. As you can see, it's not a great place to be. I don't think we would ever choose to be there. So let's move on. Coming back to this, now I'd like to look at parent. And remember, we're talking about the controlling parent here. We're talking about that point where you've given the person time to do whatever it is they need to do, and you've tried to be reasonable and very adult about it, but actually now time's going, it's just getting so important, and for goodness sake, will you just do it? That moment. And even when you've said it, even as you're saying it, Inside you're going, oh no, why did you do that? Because relationships are like trust. They take years to build, but only a few seconds to damage. So that snapping moment, that oh, sense of frustration with somebody else and the desire to tell them what to do. Can you remember that? Go back there for a minute and just find for yourself what emotions you're feeling then. Now, as you can see here, here are some more of the very common responses that we get from groups when we work with them. Again, not a very pleasant place to be. And also, if you look at this, you'll see, although externally these two states of dependent child and controlling parent seem very different, actually, when you look at the internal experience, they are amazingly similar. The same words of, of fearful, anxiety, impatience, anger, lack of respect, that sense of having no space or, or space for movement or development. Nobody would choose to be here. And they're both states based upon our old friend, fear. They are fearful states. Let's come back to this. So now let's look at adults. Ever had an adult-to-adult -adult relationship? Of course we have. So I'd like you to think of that person or those people with whom you have a real adult-to-adult -adult relationship. Bring them to mind. And now, once again, what emotions do you feel when you're working with them? When you're interacting with them, when you're playing with them? Write them down. And then look here are some of the, again, the more consistent responses we get from groups when we ask them that same question. Instead of being a state of fear, of protectiveness and defensiveness, of anger and aggression or defense, whichever way you want to put it, our adult self lives in a space of openness, of calmness, of real connection, awareness and connection with others of mutual respect. 
And there is a sense of space there as well. The space, I'm here, you're there, and between us is this space. And it is in this space that exploration takes place. There's no need for me to dominate you to prove that I'm right. We explore the different views and find the higher truth of whatever it is we're discussing, or at least the more combined truth. It is the space in which creativity takes place, in which understandings take place. Why would we ever wish to be anywhere else, internally and externally, than in this adult space? Well, we don't. And that's one of the issues here. We do not suddenly choose to be in our parent or child space. These behaviours are so deeply patterned within us. These behavioural paradigms are so deep in us. Remember that we learned how to be that dependent child before we even knew we existed. That they are triggered by circumstance, and we know this. Because suddenly we find ourselves behaving in a way, and our inner voice is probably saying, do something, say something, and you go, I can't, I'm in lockdown. These things are very strong and they're triggered before we know it. So how, how can we work with this? We'll come to that in a minute. But one principle to really take out of this. We say that unless you can access and maintain in yourself this adult space and enable others to access it, you cannot really lead. It is in this space of mutuality, of transparency, of respect and exploration that you can act relative to that unique moment. If you are in parent or child, you can only react to whatever is in there under the influence of behavioural paradigms and influences that were instilled years, decades ago. So you either react from these, and if you're reacting, you cannot be leading, because leading is acting in that moment, in the time, for the place, and for the people within that moment. So that's the key thing, accessing this adult space in yourself. Now, if these are states of fear, how do we access this? Well, the first thing is using all those techniques that we've talked about to come back into the moment, to release the fear and the tension, physically, emotionally and mentally, to release that, to come back into the moment of presence. And in doing that, we come back into our adult self. If these really get us, we can, when we're very good at doing that, we can control it. But often, once we're triggered in the parent, child or the parent, we can't do anything about it in that moment. What I recommend there is that when you walk out of a situation and you find yourself going, oh, I've done it again, why do I always react like that to that person or that situation? Don't worry about it, don't beat yourself up. Simply make a note of what the situation was and who the person was. And you do that for a month or so. And at the end, as you read through it, you will see your pattern. You will see your triggers and forewarned is forearmed. So the next time you go into that situation, the next time you go to have a meeting with that person or see them, you can prepare beforehand. Remembering, sensing yourself, being very present, because presence gives you an insulation for what's going on out there. And then remembering your purpose. And then going into that situation. And you're likely to be able to maintain this. How does that help somebody else? Well, we talked before, many people only have the parent and child strategies for interacting with other people. In fact, if you look at some of the people that are uh, in some ways very successful in organisational corporate world, they get there by being throwing tireless tantrums and being controlling parent. I'm the boss, I'm CEO, you do what I say, you don't question. If somebody does question, they throw a tantrum. Don't you know who I am? Don't you behave like that with me? Instilling fear, creating this child. God, I better not do that when they're around again. And that's how they get where they get, through the use of fear. The problem with that, of course, is far from liberating the potential of the people that they work with or in their organisation or their friends, it does exactly the opposite. It closes it down. It destroys creativity, empowerment and engagement. 
as you know from what we talked about in what you feel, the adult space, particularly in leadership and parenting, is the space that enables the liberation of that other person's potential and that other person's authenticity. So that's, that's one thing. If you find yourself in the adult, but the other person is still getting upset or angry or throwing a tantrum, they will call it, of course, some justified response, but basically it's just like a three-year-old throwing a tantrum. Remember that you are not responsible for their emotional state. It is not your responsibility, just as they are not responsible for yours. By maintaining your adult presence, you will be connecting with them at the subconscious level in a way that gets through their apparent anger or upset. And if you hold that long enough, they will come back to that space and connect from their adult place. Much as if you've had children and they want an ice cream and you say no until after lunch and then they go, well, mm, please daddy, can I have an ice cream? Very nice child. No, they can't. Then they throw a tantrum, go on to the ice cream. And they go up and down and up and down until in the end they just accept it. And they, you say, should we go for lunch now? And they go, yeah, okay. Ice cream after lunch, yeah, that's fine. The same works with adults because if they're using these strategies, if you can maintain your adult, not only does that give them the opportunity to get out of that fearful, painful space they're in, but the true adult space also links through to compassion and respect, which is something that clearly, if we're in these fates, we could do with. One final thing on this. One of the reasons we talk about this is because if you're working in an organisation or a hierarchical structure, and a family is hierarchical, that subconsciously, and almost automatically reinforces parent-child behavior if you're not careful. I work for you, so I'll do what you say, but you work for me, so if I get any from him, I'm gonna dump it on you, yeah? So that's why organizations, families have to work very strongly if they want to remove that hierarchical parent-child and create a truly creative, empowered and engaging culture because it's not the organization's fault although it can be if people want to use it but we bring it in in ourselves these triggers or these paradigms are in us waiting to be triggered and as we say first we have to lead ourselves before we can lead or even be properly led by others <laughs>